Now, as it happens, I came to the Roman Catholic Church from a liturgical church, from the Anglican Church, and from the high Anglican branch of that church. So I must tell you I found no difficulty whatsoever adjusting to Catholic liturgy, most of which I discovered I already knew by heart anyway, because the Catholic liturgy and the Anglican liturgy is very, very similar. For converts coming from non-liturgical churches, the transition might be much more difficult. I don't know, I haven't experienced that, but it might be. I must tell you that I worried in advance that I might miss the great Anglican hymns and the great Protestant hymns, but I need not have worried. Modern revisions of Protestant hymnals have rewritten, or in many cases purged, on the grounds of political correctness, hymns like, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, or Faith of Our Fathers, they're gone in the Protestant hymnals, so they might give offense to someone. But there's still some enthusiastically in my Catholic parish, and in the original words, I might add. In fact, last Sunday, a week ago, in our concluding hymn, I thought this was wonderful at our Sunday Mass, was Martin Luther's Ein Festeberger. A mighty fortress is our thought, the foundational hymn of the Protestant Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so that's, that's the kind of ecumenism that interests me, honestly. Not, not the World Council of Churches, perhaps. Now, three, there are three, I found three minor cultural shocks when I came to the Catholic Church, and they still have the power to surprise me. One is the fact that the Mass is said every day of the week and several times on weekends wonderful thing, and how utterly foreign to a Protestant who's used to one Sunday service. Secondly, Masses in my parish are noisy, well attended by a diverse congregation including lots of families and young children. Protestant services are by and large very sparsely attended by great heads. It's not a Christian, that's just a statement of fact. Third, the parish's outreach to the sick and to those in nursing homes and to the lonely and to the dying is certainly much more vigorous than anything Nora and I had ever experienced in any Protestant church. Now that may in part be a tribute to the energy of my own parish priest and Sister Mary Boer, who's here and who does a lot of that work, but I rather suspect it's more than that. I think, it's, I think to some extent it is a denominational difference. We were just astounded when we came into the parish to see how the parish looks after its people. It's completely foreign to our experience in the Protestant churches. And what a delight to hear pro-life convictions affirmed from the pulpit in intercessory prayers for the unborn and parish events like the annual life chain. Mainline Protestant churches, by contrast, have become either partisans for abortion or culpable by their silence in what I believe is the greatest moral issue of our generation. Now, let me turn now for a few minutes, if I may, to a few matters of doctrine where significant culture shock awaits the Protestant newly arrived or newly beached on the rock of St. Peter. <laughs> First is the centrality of the Eucharist. In Protestantism, the sermon is the centerpiece of worship. Now, as it happens, I'm a connoisseur of sermons. In the age of 10, when I sat next to Cliff Barrows on the platform at Maple Leaf Gardens and for the first time heard Billy Graham preach, I had been fortunate to hear many fine Protestant preachers, Dr. Leonard Griffith and Dr. John Gladstone, to name the two exemplars. Those whom I haven't heard personally, I have read preachers like Martin Lloyd-Jones or Leslie Weatherhead, Austin Farrar and Harry Emerson Fosdick. So when I became a Catholic, I rather expected, I must confess, the homilies to be a bit of a letdown. It's been just the opposite. The homilies that I've heard since becoming a Catholic have been compelling and strengthening. And I've concluded that there are two generic reasons for this, uh, apart from the homiletic gifts of my own priest, which are very considerable. The first is that it seems to me Catholic homilies tend to be much less ambitious than Protestant sermons. Catholic homilies that I've heard are usually a short reflection on and application of the appointed gospel of the day. And I believe this is a case where less is decidedly more. The brilliant sermon, eloquently delivered, which charmed me when I was a Protestant, would leave me utterly cold today. The second reason is that as surely as the Protestant, as Protestant worship is built around the sermon, Catholic worship is built around the Eucharist. As the Catechism puts it, the Eucharist is, quote, the source and summit of church life. 
Christ's sacrifice on the cross is relived at every gathering of the community until his coming again. Now, how could I, for six decades of my life, have missed a point as obvious as that? How could I have settled for someone, however eloquent, for someone's exposition of sacred text instead of the actual body and blood of Christ? How could I have mistaken talking about it for doing it? I hang my head and have no answer. The Catechism asserts that the Eucharist is a sacrament of love, a sign of unity, a memorial of our Lord's death, and a divine banquet, quote, and I'm quoting now from the Catechism, in which the mind is filled with grace and the pledge of future glory. As early as the second century, when St. Justin Martyr writes to the pagan emperor Antoninus, and Antoninus' dates, just so you can put this in context, are 138 to 161 AD, that's the early year. Justin Martyr describes a liturgy of the Eucharist, which in its basics, would be familiar to a Catholic anywhere in the world today. Now, I think that's an unbelievably remarkable thing. Rome's unbroken line to the earliest manifestations of the Christian church remains to me a source of continuing amazement and consolation. Now, of course, Catholics assert that when the priest consecrates the bread and wine, those elements become the actual body and blood of our Lord. This is what is meant by the doctrine of transubstantiation. Now that's a doctrine that can give Protestants apoplexy. And I could here, I could here, if I wished, insert a theological defense of transubstantiation, but I'm not going to. Instead, I'm going to tell a true story about Flannery O'Connor. Flannery O'Connor, the Catholic novelist and short story writer, was at a cocktail party in New York with a lot of other writers and intellectuals. And after much desultory conversation, uh, the topic wandered onto religion, and the conversation became ever more vague and abstruse and depersonalized, until the New York novelist Mary McCarthy quite loudly proclaimed that she considered the Eucharist to be a useful symbol, at which Flannery O'Connor, a very shy, quiet, reserved woman, but a bread-in-the-bone Catholic, shouted out, well, if it's just a symbol, I say to hell with it. <laughs> now, I think if you ponder that little vignette, that true story, you will learn more about the difference between, bedrock difference between Catholics and Protestants than any theological justification I can give you. In his latest book, Light of the World, just out from Ignatius Press, Pope Benedict, Benedict XVI answers a question put to him concerning eschatology, the last things, and particularly the second coming of Christ. And the Pope answers the question by reference to the Eucharist. I want to quote you just what the Pope said. Quote, Jesus' statement, I will come again, was originally, uh, sorry, Jesus' statement, I will come again, comes before everything else. That is why the Mass was originally celebrated facing east toward the returning Lord who is symbolized in the rising sun. Every Mass is therefore an act of going out to meet the one who is coming. This eschatological realism becomes present in the Eucharist. We go out to meet him as the one who comes. And he comes already, now, in the anticipation of the final hour at which one day he will come once and for all. Isn't that a what a, what a blessed thing to have Benedict as the Pope. I mean, that book, by the way, it's the latest of the interview, book, interview books that Peter Seawall has done with Benedict. And there, there are insights like that on every page. I don't know whether Phil has any, or whether he bought any today of those, but I know Phil can get them for you. If he, if he doesn't have any here, he can get them for you. And it's called Light of the World, and it's just out from the Ignatius uh, Press. And it's very much worth reading. Let me turn now to another aspect of Catholic teaching that often occasions Protestant apoplexy, namely the place of the Virgin Mary, what in the old days Protestants used to accuse Catholics of Mariolatry. That was the great phrase, Mariolatry. Now this is what the Catechism actually says at the point. And I quote, what the Catholic faith believes about Mary is based on what it believes about Christ. And what it teaches about Mary illumines, in turn, its faith in Christ." Unquote. Now, what professing Christian could 
possibly object to that. Luke chapter 1 verse 28 tells us that the angel saluted Mary as, quote, full of grace. Grace is always in Scripture a gift of God. So before Mary conceived, she had been especially singled out for God's blessing, God's grace. And that's the genesis of Catholic teaching about Mary. Her response, I am the handmaid of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word, was acceptance of the divine plan of salvation. Back in the second century, St. Irenaeus puts it this way. He says, being obedient, Mary became the cause of salvation for herself and for the whole human race. And St. Thomas Aquinas puts it this way. By uttering her yes, Mary speaks in the name of all humanity. Mary's next acclaimed by her cousin Elizabeth as, quote, the mother of our Lord, Luke 1.43. So for Christians, the Orthodox Church is very explicit about this. Christians, Mary is Theotokos, the mother of God. And scripture says of Mary, all generations shall call me blessed. And I must tell you, when I was a Protestant, I used to puzzle and wonder why more was not made of Mary. How could you miss this? How could you miss the, the Theotokos? Um, and in that sense, I would echo what Richard John Newhouse called his con uh, conversion account, which is in Canadian Congress. Richard John Newhouse, if you look up his piece, he calls it on becoming the Catholic I always was. And uh, I would echo that, because I used to puzzle as a Protestant how they could leave Mary out of account. The Catholic Church's devotion to Mary is properly intrinsic to worship. As the encyclical Lumen Gentium expresses it, Mary shines forth on earth a sign of certain hope and comfort to the pilgrim people of God. So what's left then of so-called Mariology? I submit that Catholic teaching about Mary is much more literally true to Scripture than the scriptural literalists who object to Mariology. <laughs> and on the point of fidelity to the Scripture, by the way, might I quote exactly what the Catechism says here. The Catechism says, paragraph 105, quote, the Church accept, accepts as sacred and canonical the books of the Old and New Testaments, whole and entire, with all their parts, on the grounds that they were written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they have God as their author and have been handed on as such to the church herself." Unquote. Now, Billy Graham, who's 93 years old today, by the way, it's his birthday, I put it to you, could not, would not object to one single word of what I just read there. 